Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit, and then I'm going to talk a little bit. And, uh, okay, so... Hey, Eric. Wow, from India. Wow, from Delhi. Awesome. Hello. Cool. Uh, let's see. Hello from Texas. Hi, Eric. Uh, hello from Delhi, India. Hi, Michael. Uh, Matthew James uh, Barstorf, do you give private virtual lessons other than twice a year from Patreon? Uh, I do sometimes give private lessons. I'm not doing a lot of it these days just because I'm on the road a lot, so scheduling gets tricky. But uh, if you're interested in lessons, you can always drop me a line. Uh, you can email me lessons at adamlevy.com and uh, maybe later this year in the fall or something we can set something up uh thanks for asking so what what i've been playing here this little uh two note the two notes at a time blues thing is based on an exercise uh from this book of mine it's called string theories uh, it's a book that I co-wrote. Oh, hey, Todd. Good to hear from you. Uh, this is a, uh, my book, String Theories, that I co-wrote with my friend Ethan Sherman. And there's an exercise at the very beginning of this book uh, that a few people have asked me about. And so I thought maybe maybe it's more complicated than, than I thought. I, I tried to put it in the book in a way that's self-explanatory, but um, I'm going to break it down a little bit here in this. And if you want to ask me questions about other stuff, uh, you can. But I want to start at least with 
uh, with this exercise and how it works and how you could apply it yourself. I think it's a really good exercise for warming up your hands, also for warming up your ears, and just for warming up your imagination. And something that I, I like to think of as the ability to see around the corner. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, when you're playing music, sometimes all we can see is this one frame of the film that we're in in, in any given moment because there's just so much to think about, right? But music, remember, when we're playing music, we're not just like um, solving a, a crossword puzzle or a Sudoku or Sudoku or whatever, um, where we can sit and stare at it for as long as we want to. And then, aha, the word is this or the number is this or whatever. Music happens in time. So... Uh, it's more like dancing than like doing crossword puzzles. But a lot of us, uh, myself included, forget that sometimes and try to approach music like it's a crossword puzzle or, or a, you know, a wordle or a Sudoku or something. So I want to talk about this exercise and I also want to talk about how to... Um, how to get it to flow and and move forward and and work on the thing of being able to see around the corner because it's really important in music to 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 be able to do that to do you know what i mean i hope that makes sense i'm going to uh, read from the book so this is chapter one this chapter is called practice makes music and this is the tip tip warm up your ears and your hands if you practice a lot, you might already have a warm-up routine, something that you do at the start of your practice time that gets your hands acclimated to the instrument, gets the blood circulating, and stretches you out a little bit. Uh, this is particularly helpful if you are planning to practice for a long while or to challenge yourself technically in any way. There are lots of resources on warming up the hands but we need to warm up our ears too. And then there's a little aside in here. I don't know if you can see this, but there's a little drawing of me. So I kind of pop into my own book and interrupt myself. Uh, and I say, I was talking about warm ups with my friend Ken Rosser, who's a great guitar player in Los Angeles. Uh, he mentioned a 12 bar blues warm up that he sometimes, sometimes does at the start of a practice session to warm up his ears and hands at the same time. I tried it myself and found it to be valuable, fun, and interesting. Okay, so then we get into the, what the warm-up is. Uh, Ken's warm-up. Play a 12-bar blues progression, unaccompanied, to a metronome at a slow, medium tempo. Uh, in each measure, only play whole notes, but two notes simultaneously, a.k.a. diet. So that's just a couple of sentences here where it says Ken's warm up, uh, but already I see where that could lead to some confusion. So uh, play unaccompanied, meaning don't use a backing track, uh, don't use your looper, don't get a friend to jam with you. I mean, those are all good things to do, but not for this exercise. So you're going to be by yourself, but with a metronome, because we want to keep steady time, we want to have the sense of the music moving forward. And whole notes, if you don't know what that is, uh, people have asked me about this, so apparently that's not something everybody just, I shouldn't take for granted that everybody knows what a whole note is. So a whole note, if we are in 4-4 four, four time, also known as common time, so thinking 1, 2, 3, 4. If that's how you're counting the music, 2, 3. A whole note would be a note that lasts for for four beats in that time. Two, three, four. Ba. That would be a whole note because it lasted for four beats. Ba. That's what a whole note is. In four, four time, it's a note that lasts for all four beats in a measure of four, four time. 
and slow to medium. I mean, slow the slow medium tempo. That's uh, that's all relative, but. I would look to to do this exercise anywhere between 52 and 72 beats per minute on your metronome. So there we go. Everybody with me so far? Hope I haven't lost anybody or put anybody to sleep. I'm just I want to break this down so that so that it's clear because uh, I think it's a valuable, fun, and interesting exercise. Okay, so we're going to play a 12 bar blues progression that also needs some definition. Uh, let's say we're in the key of G, and if you think of this as uh, 12 measures of music, and we'll just in our imaginary music staff here, we'll do uh, four measures per line, so three lines, four bars each. Uh, we're going to start on G7, that's the first measure. Second measure is C7, then two more measures of G7. So again, G7. C7, G7, G7. If you like Roman numerals, that would be one, four, one, one. That's the first four bars. Next four bars is two bars of C7, then back to G7 for two bars. So that's two bars of C7, that's the four, then back to the one, two bars of G7. We're almost done. There's one more line. Then we're going to go D7, C7, G7, D7. So that's five, four, one, five. There's different variations on a blues, but that's a real kind of basic way to do it. So once again, from the top, uh, 12 bars, I'm just going to say the names of the chords. There's one chord per bar or one chord per measure. Measure and bar are uh, interchangeable in this context. So uh, G7, C7, and write this down if you if that helps you. Grab a, a pen or pencil or whatever. G7 from the top. G7, C7, G7, G7. C7, C7, G7, G7. D7, C7, G7, D7. Cool? Everybody cool with that? So, all right. Any questions? Any questions so far? Anybody? Uh, okay. Uh, so now I'm continuing the book. Things to listen for. Uh, melody. Listen to the top notes as a melody and the bottom notes as a secondary melody or accompaniment. So what I mean by that is when we're playing, my cat just ran away. He was hiding under my guitar and was surprised when the guitar moved. So if I'm playing two notes, so I'm thinking of G7, right? So let's say I start with these two notes. Focus on melody as in the higher note is the melody, and then this is an accompanying note or supportive note. So as the chords change, think of this note as your melody, and whatever you put beneath it, it is a melody. So that could be maybe this. So of course, now there's two melodies going on. But I want you to focus on the upper part as being uh, the thing that is the melody. And the lower part is an accompaniment part. All right. Um. <laughs> cool. Hey, Vintage Hot Rod 175. Uh, the other thing besides melody that you want to focus on is harmony. How do the notes that you're playing relate to the chords that are happening invisibly behind you? So nobody's playing the chords right now, but in your mind, you want to be able to hear the suggested chords in your mind and hear how the two notes that you're playing, that you are actually playing out loud, how those relate to the, the structure of the blues and the chord progression, the underlying progression. Okay. So a little bit more. Uh, 
As we do this, our fingers are moving very slowly. Whole notes, that's slow. Uh, and our ears can tune into the separate notes and their movement. When you play a big chord right off the bat, it's harder to hear the distinct notes, to, to hear the distinct notes than to hear the chord as a big chunk of sound. We want to have two notes and hear them both clearly, right? So the idea here is if you just play a big chunky chord, for most folks, your ear just hears the top note as the melody, maybe hears the bottom note, and everything else is kind of blurred together in this chunk of sound. When we limit ourselves to just two notes, it's easier to really hear each one. Uh, okay, don't simply count through the four beats and then think of where you're going next. Well, all the notes are ringing out, you can listen ahead to where you want to go. Follow your ears. Yeah, follow your ears. Uh, as the two notes are ringing, get hungry for something new to happen and then feed that hunger by going there or staying where you are. That might make you hungrier. <laughs> uh, uh, this is a way to make music where you're thinking about the guitar in a melodic and contrapuntal way. Contrapuntal refers to the relationship between two independent melodic lines. Uh, this can pay off over time, opening up possibilities on the guitar that you wouldn't get to if you were playing familiar chord shapes all the time. It warms up your hands and strengthens the connection between them, between your hands, and your inner ear. Uh, so I don't, I don't mean that in a like a you know, anatomical way, but just like your, your hands, the stuff you're playing and your inner ear, meaning your imagination and what, what you're hearing. And uh, if you if you're just tuning in, I'm reading, this is from my book, String Theories. This is the first exercise in the book. And uh, I just wanted to break it down a little bit, show you how to get into it. If, if this feels like uh, it's not accessible to you at the level that you are at. So uh, now there's the part at the end where it says things to do. So there's short-term, medium-term, and long-term things to do. Uh, today, do this exercise. This month, do this exercise in a new key daily. Given that there are 30 days in a month and 12 keys, you'll hit each key at least twice and some three times. You could rotate through the keys chromatically or by the circle of fourths, fourths or fifths. Uh, keep, keep a record in your practice journal of which key you warmed up on in any given day so that you know uh, yesterday I was in G, today I'm, I'll do something else. Uh, this year, do this exercise every day, but in a new key every month. So now, since there's 12 months, uh, you could spend a whole month in G and then the next month you could be in C, and then the next month you could be in whatever other key you want, and just tick them off one by one. So that is the exercise. Okay, here's Eric. I've had the book for a month now, and I can tell it will be one I dip into for the rest of my life. I was very curious to get a demo of this exercise. I'm going to demo the exercise, Eric. How do you like that? Um, okay, so let's start uh, I'm going to think about this first one note at a time. So let's take the first four bars, and we're going to just play the root of each chord as the melody. So here's a G. Uh, you know, well, I'm going to just keep everything real simple in the in the kind of first position ish. Uh, maybe we'll go up the you know up here later, but we'll just keep it real simple here. So G. Here's your C. Here's your D. And that's all we need to know for now. We're just going to do a one note version of this exercise. So here we go. One, two, three, four. G to you. Here comes C. Two, three, four. Back to G. Two. If it stays on G. Three. And then it goes to C bars back to G for two bars three, 
Here's D7, two, C, two, three, four, G. And then the last bar is D7. Okay. Is that doable? Does everybody think that that's something they could do without, uh, without any uh, stress or anything like that? I hope so. Uh, I'm going to keep going. But if you have questions as I go along, please uh, type them in here so I can make sure that I can address them. All right. By the way, I, I should say uh, if you do not have the book and you're curious about it, this is a link to the book so you can check it out. All right. Um, okay. So the next step, once you can do that, would be let's uh, let's add one more note for each chord, and we're just going to use the same kind of intervallic shape for each of the chords. So when it's G, uh, we've already got the root in the melody. So let's add the third below it. So on a G seven chord, G is the root, B is the third. So we're going to play the G and we'll play the B. Uh, on the C7 chord, we're going to do the same thing, C with E below it. And then for the D7 chord, we play D with F sharp below it. So this is our G, this is our C, this is our D, and that's G again. So one, two, three, four, G, four, C. C, back to G, here comes D or D7, C or C7, back to G, D7, now I'll do the same thing one more time. G, that's the one. C is the four. G is the one. Going to C now. That's the four. Cool. Thanks. So that would be, if you're just starting out, that would be a great way to just kind of get it going. And as you play it, see if you can first focus your ear on this note. And then while it's ringing, focus your ear on this note. So there's two notes. And... the D7, D, F sharp, go to C, C, G, G, B, G, B, right? And so you can hear this is going, these are the roots, and you can hear the thirds going. That's that's already a lot. Like this is probably the the place where, um, if this kind of work is new to you, you're just going to be like, wait, what? How can I hear two notes at the same time? Just do it and try it. This is like, I mean, I don't meditate, so I don't know, but I imagine this is something like learning to meditate, and it just takes focus and practice and time and sometimes not getting it and you know but you just keep coming back to it 
That's that's really what it is. Just keep coming back to it. So, okay. So now let's try another shape. So this this was one kind of shape where we play the root and the third below it. Let's try one where we, where we play the root and we play the fifth below it. So on a G7, I'm going to play G and D. For C7, I'm going to play C and G. And then for D7, I'm going to play D and A. Two, three, four. If you have a guitar, hope you are playing along with me. Here comes D7, so we're going to play D with A below it. And C with G below it. And then G with D below it. And then the final chord is D7. Now, I would do this with a metronome. I'm not doing it with a metronome because uh, I'm using my phone as a camera. This is my phone here. Uh, and my metronome is in my phone. So uh, if you are doing this and you're not doing it as a YouTube live stream, hopefully you can uh, use your phone as a metronome. Or even better, maybe you have a standalone metronome, uh, either the old-fashioned TikTok kind or, uh, you know, an old Franz plug into the wall metronome or whatever you have, just something that keeps steady time is fine. Uh, that would be really useful for this exercise. I'm just having to be a human metronome because I'm, well, I said why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, any questions so far? Uh, one thing about doing it this way, like this is a great way to get started with just these parallel shapes. But pretty soon, when, once you can do that, you'll start to realize that it's not that interesting musically because everything is just moving kind of uh, in parallel and doesn't it doesn't connect necessarily in the most melodic way. So uh, after you do this, oh, at what speeds, says Many Vibes, uh, I would do this uh, depending, depending on your skill. I, I would probably start around 52 BPM and crank it up as high as 72 BPM. I don't think you need to do this exercise any faster than 72 BPM. Uh, because the point is you want to be able to hear it and... and, and if you go too fast, you're just going to be kind of chasing after something. So uh, if that becomes really easy for you and you want to go faster, that's fine. But as a warm-up exercise, which is what, how I think of this, uh, I don't think you need to go any faster than 72 beats per minute. So, so now let's start to look at how to do this, not in a just parallel way, but in a way where things are a little more connected and have more flow. So if this is our G chord, where we've got G and B, and we want to go to C7, there's a couple of ways of doing that where one note moves and the other one doesn't. So if we move this B up to C, and we keep G where it was, now on the C7, we're playing um, the root and the five on this C. Or we could move the B down to B flat. And now we're playing the 7 and 5 of C7. So we went from G to C7. And then we could go back. Then when it goes to C7 again, we can be here. Back to G7. And now for D7, uh, we have to move both of these notes because uh, G is not in a D7 and B is not in a D7. So one thing we could do is go up and play C and A. That's the 7 and the 5th of, of D7. 
Another thing we could do is go down to A and F sharp. That's the fifth and third of D7. So when we're here, we can either go here or here or, or somewhere else entirely, but I'm trying to do it with kind of minimal motion. So this could be our, our G7, our C7. This could be our D7. So I'll do it now, just for the sake of time, I'm, I'm only gonna do two beats per chord. So things are gonna move a little more quickly. Two, three, four. Now I'm going to sing the bass note so you maybe can hear it a little better what's happening. Three, four. Do, 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 so that's uh, now, I think, starting to sound more musical because we're not just jumping around. Um, so let's try another starting point. Uh, so instead of starting with these two notes for G7, maybe I'll start with these two notes for G7. Now you'll notice something new here. I'm not playing a G. I'm playing D, which is the fifth of G, and I'm playing F which is the seventh of G7. So this, these two notes right off the bat might not sound like G7 if you just pick up your guitar and play them, but in your head, you need to hear boom. So that, that's what makes it a G7. Now, where are we going from here? We're in measure one. We want to go to C7. You have to look at this and say, where is there a C7 nearby? I can't keep this F. That's got to move because there's no F in C7. And I probably can't keep the D. There's no D in C7. I mean, there's a, there's a D if you make it a C9 chord. So maybe that might fly. But let's keep it to just basic 1, 3, 5, 7 chord tones for now. So if this is our G7, there's, you could get to C7 either by going down to these two notes. And in the exercise, you wouldn't break it like I'm doing these staggered right now so that you can hear them. But as an exercise, they should be played in tandem. So this is G7. That could be C7. We could also go up here for C7. Or we could just jump. So that could be G7, C7. Any of those could be cool. So I'll, I'll do all three. Three, four. Boom. Boom. Now the other, next one. Boom. Boom. Any of those could work. Each one is going to suggest a different melody because well, coming back to what I said earlier, we're going to think of the top note as the melody. So do you want the melody to go down? Do you want the melody to go up by step or up by a fourth? Any one of those could work. So melodically, that's... That's what's happening in the, you know, the the upper part, which is the melody. Um, any questions on that so far? Have I lost everybody? I hope I'm not making this more confusing. But what I'm trying to do is break it down so that you can do it on your own from, from the book or just from watching this video. Um, I'm going to just pause for a minute and see if there's any questions.
Okay, no questions. All right. So, uh, kind of a neat exercise would be, oh, Ivan says, let's get to the cool ones that sound disjointed. Okay, cool. So, this could be a, a neat exercise. Um, just to see what happens. I'm gonna start on the note D. Uh, well, actually, I'm gonna start a little, just slightly lower. I'm gonna start on open B. And just to see what happens, I'm gonna go up by half step for each chord. So in a 12 bar blues, we're gonna, we're gonna start on B, and we'll, so we'll play some note below it. So that's gonna be our G7. This could be our C7, and then G7. Now that's maybe a little disjointed. And I went there because we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 3, 4, 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 3, 4, 6, 2, 3, 4, 7, 2, 3, 4. So each measure we're going to go up by half step. So just as an exercise. So 2, 3, 4. I don't know if that was disjointed enough for you, Ivan, but what I'm trying to do there is follow this chromatic line all the way up, and then underneath it, just play a chord tone, usually the third or the seventh of the chord. Because then whatever's happening up top, if you're playing the third of the chord or the seventh of the chord beneath the, whatever the melody is, um, it's going to at least have some kind of grounding. So now I'm going to try it the other way around. I'm going to I'm going to start up high on D and work my way down, right? So 2 3 4 There's one in there that uh, where I doubled the A unintentionally, uh, but anyway, you get the idea. So do you see what I'm doing there? I'll, I'll, I'll do that and I'll think out loud. So I, I started here. So the, the melody note was D. I just chose that arbitrarily, arbitrarily, and we're going to come down. So I want to support that with a chord tone. B is a chord tone. Now we're going to go to C7. So I'm voice leading the B to B flat. That's the 7 of C7. But we wind up with this flat nine on top. And then um, this is G7 with C on top. That's kind of a not an expected, not a, an, an expected note on G7, but not terrible. Underneath that, I play D, because if you play some other chord tone like B, that's uh, pretty intense. We could put the F underneath it. But somehow D felt like a good choice. And then this is measure four of the blues, still G7. So that's nice consonant sound. And now C7, B with B flat in the melody. You could play C underneath it. You could play E underneath it. You could play G underneath it. Any of those would work. So chord tones other than the B flat itself. And then here's what I meant to do, because it was still C7, but now A. And then, <laughs> so G7, but with A flat in the melody. Now, uh, 
four tones, so G, F, and now D7 with F sharp in the melody. That's pretty cool. C7 with F in the melody. So I, I put, that's the 11th, I put the 9 under it. And then E is the 6th on a G7. Uh, that's the 12th measure, so D7 with E flat in the melody. And then we can end here. So that's a cool exercise to go up chromatically. You can go down chromatically. You could just have one note stay steady on top. That's another way to, to get into this. If, if doing, if moving both lines is really tricky for you, uh, the first thing I would do is this kind of parallel approach. Next thing I would do is what I'm about to show you, which is just keep one note on top. So, you know, G blues. What if we start with A on top? So that's the nine, and it could sound like this, three, four. And we go to C7 and keep A on top. Back to G7. Stay the A on top. Now this is C7. Still C7. And back to G7. Stay on G7. Playing chord tones underneath the A. Now D7. C7, G7, D7. So this is, I think, would be a good way to work on this, where one note, you don't have to think about it because it just stays where it is. Um, sometimes in music, that's called a pedal tone, when one note stays the same and other stuff moves around it. You could put the pedal tone on the bottom and move the upper voice. So that would be like this. So I'm just going to keep uh, A on, or sorry, G on the bottom of everything. Two, three, four. That's the C. Back to G. hard to play D7 with a G in that register. It's not really going to come across as a, as a D. Uh, but anyway, that's a, another way to do this exercise where one note stays and the other moves. Uh, another fun way to practice this is to limit yourself to just two strings. So you could do the middle two strings. It could be G7, C7. C7, G7, D7, C7, G7, D7. So there's this kind of uh, counterpoint concept where you look at the two notes and you see how they move. They could move uh, in parallel, which is what we were doing at the top, whether it goes down or up. I think of this in parallel because this is the interval of a sixth. This is the interval of a sixth. That's the interval of a sixth. So that's parallel motion, you can have uh, opposite motion where like one note goes up and one note goes down. So you could go, so this note went up, this note went down. 
you can have oblique motion. That's where one note stays and the other changes. Or, or uh, let's see, it could go like this. So now the lower note is staying. So you get that. So that's oblique motion. There's also uh, like similar motion where things aren't in parallel, but still both notes go up, just not at the same time clip so maybe you could go from G uh, G to let's see G uh, G to C now that's still basically parallel let's see there we go that would be similar motion where one note moves by step and the other one takes a slightly bigger so you, know, you don't have to think about that too much, but just keep track of those are some possible ways that you could move. Uh, parallel, similar, opposite, and um, what was the other? oblique, where one note moves and the other one stays the same. So those are just some ways to look at it. Um, any questions? Is, am I making the exercise more clear? I'll, I'll explain one more time if you're tuning in late. Uh, I'm talking about an exercise from this book. Uh, this is my book, String Theories. Uh, and there's an exercise at the beginning of the book that talks about playing through the blues, just using two notes uh, played together uh, for four beats each for each bar of music in a 12-bar blues. So I'll demonstrate that again. One. Two, three, four. I'm going to get a little fancy here. in here if you want to write me about lessons. Yeah, uh, as I said, I'm not I'm not booking any lessons right now, but you could email me and I could tell you more about um, more about you know the cost and availability and stuff, but it would probably be late summer or fall before I could actually schedule one. Um, I also I have a Patreon if you guys are interested. I'll, I'll put that in here as well. I post uh, many vibes. Yeah, oblique means pedal point. Oblique in counterpoint is where. Uh, one note stays and the other note moves. Could be the upper note or, you know, lower note. And I don't know if this is <laughs> helpful with my hand gestures. Yeah. Pedal point, usually people use that phrase when the, the, the pedal point is hanging there for longer than just two bars. So I don't know if it's technically correct to call it pedal point if we're just looking at two bars of music. But yeah, essentially, yes. One note stays, one note moves. Um, so yeah, I've got a Patreon uh, channel that you can check out that has, I don't know, a couple hundred <laughs> lessons there. So um, if you're looking for a private lesson and you, you want to learn from me, but you don't have time to wait until the fall, you might check out my Patreon. Um, anyway, thank you for asking, Matthew. Uh, that's uh, I appreciate it. It's just a busy season because I'm going to be in motion a lot so i'm not taking on new students at the moment uh amazingly almost an hour has gone by and mostly i've just been playing blues in g two notes at a time of course you could do this exercise in different keys 
uh, it doesn't always have to be in 4-4. Four, four. It could be in 3-4 or 5-4 or whatever. Uh, it could be in a minor key. You know, there are people play blues in minor keys. Thank you so much. That's really nice. Um, oh man, that that's really awesome. I'm so glad that I did this. The whole big idea of me going live today was to try to make this exercise accessible and not intimidating. I, when I wrote the book, I felt like we explained it uh in a clear way but based on the fact that i've gotten a bunch of questions about it uh, i see how it could be confusing and just reading it as aloud as i did i, I see where there's <laughs> uh, elements of it that, that could be confusing so i'm glad i clarified that and thanks for the tip eric that's really cool um so i'll go all the way until the hour do you have questions about this exercise or something else if you you know i'm open to talking about something else if you'd like to All right. Well, maybe I'll just play a little bit. I'll see. I'll, I'll play the minor version and I'll change keys because you're probably bored of G for now. So uh, I'm going to go. I'll do this in C, but I'll make it C minor. So the changes will be C minor, F minor, C minor, F minor, F minor, C minor, A flat 7, G7, C minor, G7. Sorry, that I said that so fast, but here, one, two, three, four.
Yeah. So that was a bit of a clam bake because I was trying to play music and read the comments at the same time. Do not do that, kids. <laughs> Uh, okay, if uh, Vintage Rod 175 says, if we have questions about the book, can we message you later? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, why is the perfect fifth called the perfect fifth? Because it's perfect. I mean, come on. Come on. Uh, no, seriously, I don't know why. Uh, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, I'll say what I do know about intervals, which is that um, you can have a perfect fifth, you can have a perfect fourth. Those are considered uh, perfect intervals. And then the other kinds of intervals are seconds, thirds, sixths, and sevenths. And those are going to be major or minor. So like this is a major third. This is a minor third. This is a major second. Minor second. Sixth. Major sixth. Minor sixth. Major seven. Minor seven. But fifths and fourths are more usually seen as perfect. You can alter them. You could have an augmented fifth or a diminished fifth. Same with fourths. You can have an augmented fourth. I guess you can have a diminished fourth, although then that looks a lot like a major third. But yeah, those are, uh, fourths and fifths are perfect when they're perfect, or they can be augmented and diminished. Uh, all the other intervals are major and minor. Uh, this is, a, if anybody's curious, yeah, this is a Waterloo. Uh, the, it's a WLS Deluxe model. Really great guitar. I love this guitar. Um, it's great for playing around the house. I've also taken it on tour. I've recorded with it. Um, if you want to hear me play real, you know, some real music on it, I did a, a video for Acoustic Guitar Magazine five or six years ago. I played a, a piece of my own called Blueberry Blonde. Let me see if I can find that on YouTube. So you can check it out here if you want to. Um, what's my favorite solo piece for acoustic guitar? Uh, oof. Oh man, I I just I can't even answer that because there's so much music. If you're asking me what I like to play, I like to play my own song, Blueberry Blonde. I think it's a pretty song and. Um, so I, I wind up playing that often if there's a chance for me to, to play a solo acoustic guitar piece. But of all music, I mean, then you're talking about everything from classical guitar to ragtime to, my, you know, Michael Hedges or like percussive slapping stuff. I just don't even, <laughs> it's too much music, but so I don't really have one. But I, I like that uh, tune of mine, Blueberry Blonde. There's there's a Julian Lodge piece uh, from his World's Fair record. Uh, it's called Day and Age that I that I like to play. That's a really nice piece. It's kind of simple. And it's a good vehicle for improvisation. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You got one more question. I'm gonna. It's it's five o'clock here. Five o'clock here in Brooklyn. So I'm going to sign off uh, pretty soon here. But if you have one more question, maybe I'll see if I can answer it. Anybody? Okay. Um, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate you guys spending the time with me. Thanks to Eric for the tip. That was a really nice thing. Um, thanks also to... Uh, somebody at the top. Oh, Vintage Rod 175 bought the book. Thank you. 
And gosh, okay. Uh, if you want to find me, you can always find me uh, here. Or here. Uh, say hello. Really appreciate you guys hanging out and uh, asking good questions. Okay, take good care, everybody.